Okay, well, welcome everybody. I'm Susie Burke. I'm coming to you from my bedroom in um, Jaja Warung land in central Victoria, where I live in a town called Castlemaine. And um, just want to say that sovereignty was never ceded and this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I also wanted to just acknowledge at the outset that we're living in a time of climate crisis. Um, this is already having an impact on our personal and professional lives. And if we don't take action urgently to do something about it, all the things that we're currently working on in our jobs are going to escalate in difficulty for our generation and for generations to come. That's the context in which I wanted to begin talking today. So I'm very pleased to be on a panel with Nikki Haray from Auckland in New Zealand and from Sam Keast in Melbourne and I'll get the two of them to introduce themselves uh, properly when they speak in a moment. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen um, and I just wanted to welcome everybody that's here and you're very welcome to put your videos on even if you're eating lunch uh, or doing other things like that because it's quite nice for us to um, you know see who we're talking to but don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but we do really want to invite people to use the chat function at the bottom and write um, their comments and your questions and your outrage as we say things that you think are outrageous um, and uh, we welcome that because we three only want to speak for a part of this session and actually be engaged in a vigorous conversation because that will really help to advance our understanding and knowledge of this particular topic that we're talking about today. So supporting youth solidarity, collective care for young actor. I can't see what I've written there because my photo's in the way. Anyway, I'll let you read that yourself. Um, so this is our topic today. Oh, there's my land, the land in which I come to you from. But our topic today um, started off um, with the title, uh, My Children Are Revolting, hashtag proud parent. And uh, this was actually a banner that I saw um, that a parent of one of the children in this photograph here had um, uh, made for himself when he was accompanying hundreds of children from Castlemaine to go down to Melbourne for uh, one of the school strikes uh, that were happening in two years ago and then last year and in a virtual sense this year as well. Um, and what we wanted to do uh, today at this conference was talk about the rise of youth activism and we particularly wanted to be looking at collective care for youth activists so that was our original idea and then when um, we got our heads together to start to plan this session which was now no longer going to be in Melbourne with some youth activists attending the conference for a few days with us and zooming in some of Nikki's youth activists in New Zealand we were discussing whether I should whiz across to the high schools just across the road down my drive and pluck a few of these children out of their classroom and get them to come along and join this Zoom call and talk to us um, about you know what youth activism has meant to them, what they what they enjoy about it, what motivates them, but also what some of the challenges are. Um, and so we were discussing doing that. I said yes, yes, there's a couple of kids there that I could easily get to come along and talk about that. And then we talked about how uh, careful we would have to be in our subsequent conversation about youth activism if we had them with us. And eventually I said to Nikki, you know, we don't need to invite them along, actually. We could just decide to have this space to talk amongst ourselves around some of the issues that have become more and more obvious to some of us working in the um, climate movement um, and also working as a psychologist in research around social activism that, um, that are becoming more and more on our minds with the rise of um, youth activism, which has been an absolutely marvellous thing that we've seen over the last couple of years, um, but has also raised a whole lot of problems and questions. So then we decided that we would pose to ourselves and to our audience this question uh, to consider problems and tensions with how young people's activism is perceived. And so each of us are going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm beginning. Uh, so just to go back a little bit, this is my daughter Malou from many, many years ago when I used to run a forest kindergarten in, a, in an eco village that I live in. Um, and I used to have children come into the forest and we would have run our kindergarten there and Malou would trail along behind us in her gumboots. And um, 
Um, and at the same time, I was working part time at the Australian Psychological Society with Heather Goodley and other colleagues and increasingly was working on environmental issues and, uh, and environmental threats like extreme weather event disasters. And uh, we were also looking at the research into how to um, establish environmental values in children and nature connection and how to help children to be first in nature so they can then be with nature so that ultimately they become, become, can become for nature, that they can be taking responsibility for nature and acting for it. And at the same time, I also started to do some work with Anne Sanson, who's a developmental psychologist in Melbourne, and um, Judith Van Horn, who's a developmental psychologist in America. And we collaborated together with the APS and we produced a couple of um, documents. One was a guide for parents about the climate crisis and another one was a document called Raising Children um, to Thrive in a Climate Changed World. And so in that document, what we were looking at was four different uh, types of skills and capacities that young people need to be helped to develop um, in order to thrive in what is undoubtedly going to be a climate altered world. First was individual level skills and capacities, you know, things like self-regulation, flexibility, empathy, um, values of justice and equity and things like that. The next was interpersonal skills, so things like being able to cooperate with others, healthy relationships, conflict resolution skills and things like that. The third was social engagement, so being engaged with the community, being a joiner, joining groups, participating in your local community. And the fourth one was civic engagement, which is things like active citizenship skills, you know, being able to understand the democratic process, participate in the democratic process at that level. And, um, and so whilst we were writing these, Greta Thunberg began to do her school strike in um, in Sweden, outside uh, the steps of Parliament, as a solitary <laughs> child who was declaring uh, that action needed to be taken on climate change. And I remember at that time, my daughter Malou, who was then 13, so that was that little girl in the, in the picture, saying to me, um, she read the article about Greta and she said, I could do that. And as I heard her say that, I heard Anne Sanson in the background saying, it's really important that we teach children civic engagement skills and, and that part of that is, um, you know, listening to what they're concerned about and, you know, supporting them in that. So I said, yes, um, how do you think you'd do that? And she said, oh, well, I think first of all, I'd speak to my friends, Harriet and Callum. And I said, yes, well, do that. So off she went. And what that then led to was her, oh, this was, a, this was, just another little bit of background. This was um, climate activism wasn't new to Malou, and for many, many years, she and many of the children in our community had been coming along with us to rallies. And this had been a photo that I'd taken a couple of years before this, when she was in about class six or year seven at the Steiner School. And she'd written a note to the teacher to say she was going to be leaving school early to go and protest the Adani mine, which is an enormous um, coal mine in Queensland. Um, and so. Yeah, so when she had this idea that she could uh, copy what Greta was doing, she knew exactly what the steps were. You get your friends together, oh, this is a, a previous action, but um, you get your friends together and you go and sit outside, you know, your senator's office. And the senator at the time was a, a National Party Senator, Bridget McKenzie. So this was the very first day of their strikes. The police turned up. I accompanied a group of children that Malou and Harriet and Callum had collected together. There was about 20 of them. And um, they all went off enthusiastically, went to school, went up to Senator Bridget McKenzie's. And the police turned up a few minutes later and came up to me and said, oh, could I please speak to the organisers? And I said, oh, yes, well, that will be them. And pointed them over to three small children sitting uh, uh, in front of the on the doorstep and so this was a but the first photo I had of the children taking responsibility for organizing this this demonstration and so from then you know things built and they this was the very next day they had even more children there outside the second politician in town's office and she actually invited them in and sat around the table with them had a good chat and then there was the big strike that they had organized that then was joined by um, children from all around Australia and also in other parts of the world as well so this was this is the town of Castlemaine that had turned up on the V-line train and gathered in front this is just next to our, our main station in Melbourne 
and they all gathered on the, um, the, the grassy verge just outside the station, we had some photos taken, and then they marched all the way up to join the thousands of other children and um, supporters that were already up at Parliament House. So in terms of the skills and capacities that the children and I saw my daughter developing over the time, it was definitely, you know, being able to work cooperatively with other children, to be joining groups, um, to, be, uh, to be having fun. Um, it was an important part of their activism. There were the meetings that they had organised with politicians. That very first photo I showed of a whole lot of children sitting on the foyer that was them when they had gone down on one of their strike days to um, visit a politician in Melbourne and they'd all crowded in as soon as the doors were open they crowded in because they wanted to speak to him and they all you know were sitting there eating their morning tea and waiting for the uh this um politician to come out and and meet with them they weren't particularly impressed with him but you know this was all a tremendous learning of you know their civic participation as well and um I, I often show this photo because this is Malou when she was speaking with the other two children in front of a crowd of I think 5,000 children were there in Melbourne on that first strike and um, this was a photo that was published in the New York Times and what I had also noticed, which were the skills that Malou had learned in the month that they had been striking, was that initially when the journalist would ring to speak, she'd, she'd look at me and she'd scrub her face and she'd go, do I she really didn't want to speak to them at all and um but on the morning of this big strike she was still upstairs and uh, I called out oh Malou it's the New York Times on the phone want to speak and she goes okay and she whizzes downstairs and she takes the phone she heads back up into her bedroom and she gave them a little interview and then they came along and took these photos at the march and it was that that to me was just the big um example of just how far she personally developed in her capacity to say what she thought about the issues that were important to her to be brave to speak up and to, uh, yeah, to have a voice. So just at a very individual level, there, there were all these tremendous skills, which is exactly what Anne Sanson and Judith Van Horn have been telling me young people needed to be able to develop in order to um, show the signs of positive development as young adults. Oh, and they got to also go and speak to Bill Shorten when we thought he was going to be our next Prime Minister, and this is them getting very chatty and cosy with uh, their local minister. So, you know, there was all this civic development as well. But then I also was able to observe lots of problems and tensions with young people, with how the young people's activism was perceived. And I'm going to talk briefly about that and then hand over to Nikki and Sam to talk more about that. So one of the things um, that uh, was a, a, has been a real feature has been um, the attention that the media has given to young children. And from my own experience, Malou never had a mobile phone at the beginning of this and the, none of the journalists have her phone. So they always come via me. And even now when the Bushfire Royal Commission paper came out with a whole lot of dire warnings about how, yes, climate change is influencing increased intensity of bushfires around Australia and um, you know there were a whole lot of um, you know dire <laughs> forecasts of what was to come. Local journalists rang me and said would Malou be able to comment about that and um, I knew that Malou wasn't going to be interested in commenting about that at all and I said look I'm sorry she's not available but what I've noticed is that journalists are now still tending to defer to the children about things that um, like what's Malou going to say? What's a child going to say? Yes, it's terrible. I live in a place where there might be bushfires and I'm really frightened. So like to me, I find that really frustrating that the journalists are still wanting to get the young children to say something about um, these, these big global issues. Um, and I'm not quite sure why they want to do it. Anyway, that's a question for you, you the audience. You can tell me whether what you think the point of that is. But it happens every time there's a big event that, that the government should be going, oh, yes, right, that's right. We really need to pass some climate policies. They keep asking the children for their opinions. And we know what the children's opinions are going to be. You know, do something about it, you politicians. Um, this other picture is another one of the things that I've observed, which is um, it's just a distorted perception of, um, uh, you know, the, the youth activism. So this is a, a film that's been made um, called Wild Things. It's a beautiful documentary and it follows three stories. Uh, one story about the Downy mine blockades, another story about this awesome GP who's up trees in the Tarkai in the rainforest try to protect one of the biggest carbon sinks in the in the world and um, the school strikers but of course 
there's been lots of attention from, you know, documentary makers and, you know, there's this wonderful film that's been put out about Greta just recently, but my experience of watching these various documentary makers ring and come is that they, they distort the story and they, they always want to find a hero. Now, no problem with Greta being made a hero. She's very much a singular child who has got a tremendous you know, single-minded uh, passion about this thing, but I find it really bizarre and quite hard to, um, to, to, to manage in our own world because our children have always been a part of a group of activists and it's never been about, um, you know, one or two or, or three of them as being the leaders. So these three uh, children might have been the ones that started, but from then on, it, all the children were always doing it together and they understood that climate activism was always this big group thing and they weren't heroes, but documentary makers always want to make a hero out of it. And the story gets distorted. Um, to, to follow the storyline of a particular individual. I know that's, that's what documents you, that, I know that's an important part of storytelling to make a film, but it misrepresents um, what's happening um, because these children, the children that I'm familiar with, and there are, you know, there are about 70 of them in our community, were embedded in families that were activists, in a community that was activists, and they were doing it as a, as a, as a, this is a, this is just, um, this is just a thing that they do. It was not, it's, it was not particularly a special thing that's, that individual children were doing. And yet the journalists and the documentary makers kept wanting, kept wanting to individualize it, which I find is a challenging thing and a stressful thing and hard for the children to manage as well. Um, and then the last thing, and I'm just going to finish on this point was, um, just what, um, just how challenging I find some of the questions that adults will ask the children, the youth activists. Um, and of course, I'm seeing this through my own daughter's um, uh, experience, which is not going to be the same for some of the older climate um, youth activists who might have um, a much better capacity to stand up and talk in public. But I've got a quiet, shy little girl who struggles to even tell the librarian that she'd emailed something to be printed and it should be there in their system and could they check you know so when she's been invited to be on a stage at Worm Adelaide which is a really big music festival and the journalists asked asked her questions that I as somebody who's worked in the field of climate change for 17 years struggles to answer myself because it's about you know how do we tackle the wicked problem of climate change uh, it's just excruciatingly painful because I think that is such a stupid question to ask a 15 year old. And, um, but, but what they all do is they put their shoulders back and they say, well, and they come up with a really polite sort of, mm, sort of something. They come up with something. It's, it's, it's excruciating for them, but it's also, um, it's also mean, I think. Anyway, I mean, I obviously see it as a parent and I'm, uh, you know, I know how it feels when you're on a stage being asked a really, really difficult question that you don't know how to answer. But this happens all the time. I'm forever watching adults put, allow children to be in a, in a forum in front of an audience and the audience will ask some questions or the interviewers will ask some questions and they're not easy questions and they're questions that we the experienced people and the people who are used to public speaking struggle with as well and I just think we need to be really careful about that and anyway the children don't need to know the answers the children know that climate change is a huge problem and the government should really do something about it and so should be business and that's enough and so I think it's wonderful that we are listening to the children but I, I but one of the questions that I've got is are we going um too far. And the particular question that was asked here was the journalist said to them at the very end, now is there something, is there one thing that you're really excited about that's, um, you know, that's happening in the environmental space? And Malou, I saw Malou take a deep breath and she was completely surprised by the question. She said, well, um, I do think that the um, uh, Green New Deal is a tremendous thing. And the journalist said, oh, the Green New Deal, I've never heard of that. And I thought, what you've never heard of the Green New Deal? Well, you should. And she goes, "Oh, can you tell me about that?" And I thought, "Don't ask a fifteen-year-old to explain the Green New Deal. She's not going to be able to do it." Luckily, this gorgeous girl in the middle saw Malou looking at this journalist as though she didn't know what she was going to do next, and said, 
look, I can explain a little bit about that and stepped in. She was a year 12 student and did know about it. So, I mean, that's just an example. Uh, so over to uh, the next, our next speaker. That's the end of my um, sharing of my screens. So now, Please do, I can see the chat box is empty at the moment. Please do uh, put in your chats and your commentary and your opinions and your thoughts as well, because we would love to have a conversation. And I mean, Nikki and Sam and I and could talk endlessly amongst ourselves anyway, so you can always just listen into that. But it'd be great if you, you know, were joining us. So, okay, Nikki, over to you. Um, kia ora koutou, and I'm speaking to you from um, Tamaki Makaurau here in, in New Zealand, Auckland, and it's lovely to be with you all today. I'm going to try and do this in eight minutes, so do keep me to the time, um, Susie. So you can see my screen now, okay? Yeah, and uh, so the, the kind of topic that I've given for myself, bouncing off this idea of the, the problems and tensions and how we can support young people in their climate activism is the trainee activist and the apocalypse, the world of our revolting children and how we as adults can help them to navigate it. So I want to start with this quote, and I'm going to come back to this quote at the end as well. Healthy children will not fear life if their elders have the integrity not enough not to fear death. Like I say, I'm going to come back to that at the end. But what I want to start with, um, actually, before I get on to this, I'll flick back to, to that slide. Just a tiny bit on my credentials here. Um, I've worked for 13 years with a school, uh, Western Springs College, Ngā Puna Wairā in, in Auckland, that, and I've been working with the youth environment leaders in the school on this issue. So that's, that's a lot of my, how I've come to know young people in this space. It's a high school. And I've also um, worked with a young uh, school strike climate activists in Auckland um, and whenever youth uh, sustainability groups ask me to come along and be involved I always say yes. So I am a psychologist here at the University of Auckland with a strong interest in, in climate change and youth activism. So what is the world that our, our young people are facing? Well, they're facing a world of what I call a double apocalypse, which I'll explain soon. And I've chosen just a quick uh, newspaper article here to illustrate that world. This is typical of the kinds of media presentations and the kind of discourse that young people who care about these issues are facing. This is actually one that I gave to my university students to analyse in a little uh, segment on apocalyptic narratives. Now there's two sides to what these articles try and do. The first one here is they try to claim, and when I say try, I don't mean that this necessarily isn't the case, but it is still a claim. They claim that the physical planet is going to rack and ruin. So we get strong apocalyptic narratives and a very, very strong sense of urgency. Only a dozen years left for global warming, significantly worsen the risks of doubt, drought, floods, extreme heat and poverty for hundreds of millions of people, urgent and unprecedented changes, otherwise the corals will be completely eradicated. It's a line in the sand, we must act now. And you're all familiar with this kind of rhetoric. But the other side to it is that the politicians are useless. So if you look at this last paragraph, policymakers have commissioned a report on the Paris climate talks, but Donald Trump, the archetype villain gone now, we'll see if that makes a difference, got, uh, Donald Trump has promised to withdraw the US, the biggest source of historical emissions, and the Brazilian president is going to do the same thing, opening the Amazon rainforest to agribusiness. Amazon rainforest, in a sense, being the archetype of an ecological system being destroyed by climate change. So this apocalyptic double play, the physical planet is going to rack and ruin and the politicians are useless, is the world that these young people who, are, who care are being brought up in. And alongside that is a very strong narrative of facing the truth. So we all know about climate denialism and the very often the impression is that unless you man up to this apocalypse that it's we've only got 10 years and it's all going to hell in a handbasket, somehow you are in denial. So there's this real binary being created, which young people I think feel extremely acutely. 
So what kind of emotions does this lead to? Well, of course, one of them is just straight out fear. And as we know as psychologists, the, the primary impulse that fear leads to is withdrawal. Withdrawal, depression, a sort of agitation that is also um, about escape. And here's Sam in the Game of Thrones um, hiding behind a rock because this white walk is coming. And that actually successfully saves his life. But as we all know with climate change, it's hiding from the issue ultimately isn't going to work. So another strong emotion evoked by all this is anger. There's Daenerys Targaryen, who's about to um, set the city behind her on fire with her dragons. And anger is very strongly um, present in, in response to this narrative. Greta Thunberg is, is again, a, a real demonstrator of anger. That's the dominant emotion that she's displaying, or is at least is picked up by the media in the reports on her. She's very good at angry faces. And in a sense, this, this sort of blend of anger and fear leads to anxiety. And anxiety is a chronic state very often rather than these kind of fiery emotions, if you like. So the American Psychological Association defines this thing called eco-anxiety as a chronic fear of environmental doom, a kind of pre-traumatic stress. Now, while I absolutely accept that some young people, some people and young people have faced actual environmental consequences of climate change here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I don't think there are very clear examples where this is the case. And even in you know, places like Australia, obviously you've had the bushfires and so on, but most young people's day-to-day -day lives pretty much carry on as usual. So I think at least in these contexts, it's reasonable to say that the main fear isn't of the actual present and what is happening now in a physical, tangible, daily life way, but what will happen in the future when this apocalypse comes about. So what we've got is this sort of anxiety and control, anxious because something bad will happen, and this sort of sense that we should be able to stop it somehow, it's down to us, but we don't really know how. And young people, of course, have now developed the mantra, which Susie outlined really clearly in her talk of, of their role is to tell the adults do something like. So that's a sort of solution to this problem. That's my role. Tell the adults, tell the adults, tell the adults. And Greta Thunberg, again, the poster child for that sort of solution, in a sense, to this anxiety. Now, it's really important to, to recognise that anxiety isn't all bad. I'm always fascinated by what the media decides to cover and what that functions to do to preserve the status quo, because we've always got to recognise that um, the status quo is a sort of great um, lethargic beast that sucks up everything that it can into its grip. Um, so, so, so what is it functioning to do? Well, anxiety is vigilant and it can prompt us to take opportunities to mitigate the problems that we face. Strong emotions about climate change are related to strong support for climate change policy. So having a population that's anxious is good for climate change action, including having young people that are anxious. And there's a sense, I think, in which young people are, are brought in as, um, you know, a bit like cannon fodder in this to this complex problem that many, many people including the status quo, actually want to solve, but don't know how to solve. Um, and they, they they become pawns. And, and, and Susie already talked about, shouldn't use the term, but that idea of Malou and her friends being kind of pawns and some sort of media drama in which now it's on them to decide how you solve climate change. So whose job is activism? So I kind of, I, I want to put activism out there as something that's incredibly hard to do. Um, and it's it's sometimes the um, historical moment allows you to start a march and get publicity. And that's what's happened to Greta Thunberg and the school strike for climate movement. But long term, being an activist is, it's, it's actually like being a doctor, being a lawyer, being a whatever. It is, it is skilled, difficult, persistent work that is actually, in my view, adult work. Um, it's excruciatingly hard, boring, and generally very demoralizing. I've done a lot of interviews with long-term um, activists, and it is not at all easy. 
And the people who persist, I think, have extraordinary qualities, including the ability to cope with failure, shame and betrayal that are endemic to this kind of work. So do we really want our young people to be activists when we take a long, hard look at what that really means? Or is it better to think of them as trainee activists? Um, so I just want to finish with three different possible approaches to young people who come to you as an adult full of the fear, anxiety, um, and so on about climate change. Here's our 12 year old, a position 12 year old. Because of climate change, I might not get to be an adult. If I'm still alive in 10 years, I won't have a job or anywhere to live and I can never have children. This is not extreme. This is actually a pretty, in a sense, reasonable thing for a young person to say, given these, this apocalyptic media. So what do we say? Well, we can say, um, yes, you're right. We're in a terrible situation. No one's doing anything about it. You should try and save the world. Do it now or we will be lost. And I actually think implicitly that's the message we're giving to these young people, to school strike for climate people. Um, wow, we're thinking you're doing something amazing. Save us. I see you as a warrior for the climate. Okay, position number two, same same 12 year old. Um, there are lots of adults concerned about climate change. They have it under control. No need for you to worry because soon we'll have the technology to solve these problems. That's, I see you as a child and ignore your anxiety. So what's the sort of third response, the one that I'm advocating here? There are lots of people concerned about climate change. They're working very hard to find solutions. All over the world, scientists, engineers, teachers, community leaders are getting together. People have solved very hard problems before. When you are old, you can join them. So this is, I see you as a child who may one day be an activist. And it's trying to find a midway between the binary of face the truth, it's all going to hell in a handbasket, versus nothing is happening, climate change denial, that midway position that I think is lost in all this rhetoric and that I think is essential um, for our young children. So just to finish on the quote again, healthy children will not fear life if their elders have the integrity enough not to have integrity enough not to fear death. I think as adults we need to both um, absorb the possible reality of this apocalypse and get our heads around it and actually think it's okay at some level like it is okay if the world ends if people die if children die it that is what happens and we still owe it to all of us to live with beauty and wonder and joy and community while we're heading towards it we have to sort of get our heads around that i really think that and then once you get your head around that being okay I think that allows you to then solve the actual problems and make it much less likely than it was. And with young children, if they enter into a world of stability, adult stability, adults holding this problem for them, then I think they also have the capacity to live with joy and to enter into this field as they get older, if and when they choose. So that's it from me. Thank you so much. Nikki, can you hear me? Am I, being, yes. am I coming through? Yes. Thank you so much. Right, over to Sam now. Thanks, Susie. And thank you, Nikki. Um, it's always uh, a pleasure to catch up uh, and especially uh, um, I feel I feel a little bit honoured because uh, I have... I've had the privilege of working with Susie at the APS and uh, I feel like I've been a, a colleague of with Nikki at a number of conferences so uh, it's it's terrific to catch up. Um, I do want to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you um, from the uh, Yulikit uh, Willem clan of the Boonarong people um, which is down in uh, Melbourne, um, St Kilda way. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, and I would say a research psychologist uh, at Victoria University and I want to pitch, um, I guess, uh, th this idea of youth activism as a kind of epistemic struggle, a struggle to be known as a, as a knower or to have kind of youth-centred knowledge um, find a place in, in how we might think about our futures. Um, and so then what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is, is connect that if we're going to talk about kind of communities of care, uh, that we also might have to think about a kind of epistemic justice for young people. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, or, or chuck a few things on the table for our discussion, hopefully, uh, and I want to present a little bit of a potted history around how we might or, or how we've constructed the idea of youth um, and then think about perhaps activism as, as more than uh, a, a political gesture for, for some youth in particular. So let me share slides. Okay. You can see that one. 
right. I'll just leave it as that one. So a central theme around uh, much of the study of, of young people is this problematic nature of being a young person and, and even uh, um, the more problematic nature of becoming an adult, um, Wynne and White describe. It's also been described by, by um, others as seeing children as human becomings rather than human beings. And certainly a, a substantial amount of research literature have inherited these kinds of assumptions from developmental psychology which suggests that there are sort of these universal stages of development, identity formation, normative behaviours, and the relationship between social and physical maturation. However, there are some questions around the, the I guess, the theoretical veracity of those developments, um, and then certainly about the claims of, of developmental psychology, but also the roles that it plays in establishing particular subjectivities, specifically Western ones, and I would also add neoliberal forms of, of subjectivity. Um, the universal claim of developmental psychology can be seen and probably should be seen in a, a, as a socially constructed Western ideal, uh, because for a substantial proportion of the world's young people, the idea of youth as a universal stage of development uh, was and remains an inappropriate concept. Um, this is not to suggest that there is no value in trying to understand the ways in which youth is constructed in various social and political um, cultural locations, but to acknowledge that the dominant conceptions of youth and young people in places like Australia are perhaps linked to culturally specific and often psychologised versions of development. Um, the notion of adolescence proposed around a century ago uh, as it, as it was as a period of transition and turbulence. At the beginning of the 20th century, new truths about the nature of adolescence emerged, spurred on by the work of American psychologist and educator, Granville Stanley Hall, who was dubbed the father of adolescence, who popularized adolescent storm and stress and utilized the, uh, a romantic idea of youth potential and problems that mandated an increasing supervision of young lives. Hall, who was known for his public speaking, garnered popularity by tapping into middle-class concerns about the problems of correctly controlling boys to produce, and a quote from Lesko, energetic, manly and strong citizens, not docile or cautious boys. This concern for the appropriate development of boys led to unlimited work for uh, the newly minted experts in psychology, pedagogy, playgrounds and juvenile justice. In the early 20th, century, early 20th century, adolescence became seen as a crucial marker at which individual and society jumped to a developed superior Western selfhood or remained in an arrested, uh, and from Lesko again, in a savage state. Underpinning Hall's uh, conception of the importance of adolescence was an ugly dividing line drawn from his beliefs in social Darwinism and eugenics. Here he marked the difference between the rational, autonomous, than moral white bourgeois men, uh, those civilized men who could continue the evolution of race, from the less desirable, emotional, conforming, sentimental, or mythical others, namely primitives, women, and children. This gender divide marks something that was regarded as boys, as boys needing to pass through or overcome. Uh, and as Lesko says here, the very schema of adolescence as a developmental stage, femaleness loomed as an obstacle that ha had to be navigated and surpassed. We can say that femininity haunted the modern developing adolescent. Uh, which reminded me, and I'm sorry we've had to refer to the uh, chisel in chief uh, yet again. I think the this was an original tweet that he uh, put out, uh, which I think highlights this, uh, probably a, 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 people be very aware of the long history of the way in which um, hysteria has been used to uh, label women in particular. Uh, but there was this delightful, delicious rebuttal that Greta posted back to Donald in the, in the, in the last week or so uh, when he was carrying on about uh, the counting of his votes or miscounting as he claims. Um, we can also see uh, the use of education and schooling as pro pro proposed as a kind of civilizing force and that activism is therefore antithetical to the project of civilizing. Um, but what if activism is not a choice? What if activism is the protection or survival of your culture and or your epistemic authority? I did want to turn briefly just uh, to this documentary, In My Blood It Runs, and read just a small grab from the uh, information about it. If those of you hadn't seen it, um, 
you have access to it as conference attendees, um, but I can give you details later. Uh, but the story is about 10 year old Dujan, who's a child healer. He's a good hunter and speaks three languages, yet Dujan is failing in school and facing increasing scrutiny from the police. He travels perilously close to juvenile detention. His family fight to give him a strong Arangenti uh, education alongside Western education. We walk with him as he grapples with these pressures, shares his truths and somewhere in between finds space to dream, imagine and hope for his future self. In September 2019, Dujan became the youngest person at age 12 to address the United Nations Human Rights Council. As a part of the impact campaign for this film, he and his family presented the film to delegates of the United Nations and this is what he said. My name is Dujan, I'm 12 years old, I'm from Arante and Guara country and I've travelled here from Australia. Adults never listen to kids, especially kids like me. We have important things to say. I come here to speak with you all because government is not listening. I'm in a new documentary, In My Blood It Runs. In this film, there are some messages for you. There are some things I want to see changed. I want my school to be run by Aboriginal people who are like me and understand me. I want the adults to stop locking up 10 year old kids in prison. I want my future to be out on land with family strong in culture and language. I hope you can find a way to make things better, much more better. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this film. And one of the key principles stated uh, in the impact strategy of this film is that children have wisdom and, vo and their voices matter. So I think if we talk about wellness as fairness, as Isaac Pililtensky uh, refers to, I think we might need to think about fairness also in terms of epistemic justice. How do we safely and respectfully include the wisdom of young people as knowers uh, of their futures. Uh, and I think I just had, uh, sorry, I've probably run a little over time now. Oh. Some of the, uh, signs from some of the protests or the uh, school movements going on, which I think are, just an amazing uh, array of um, young people's wisdom, uh, but also the ways in which they're navigating quite complex ideas around uh, politics um, with humor, uh, but also cultural elements. I've never been so scared of a cabinet. some angry faces that Nikki was talking about. I did want to end with this one because that makes a nice, uh, a nice cross link to some of Nikki's. <laughs> That's a reference for those who don't know the font, uh, the um, Game of Thrones uh, font, winter is not coming. Um, and another one uh, around, for those who don't know RuPaul's Drag Race, the reality uh, drag show, and that's one of the taglines that he uses uh, before the drag queens do their performance on the stage, don't, uh, don't F it up. Um, so I, I really like the way they, they navigate um, and use uh, modern culture, I guess, or cultural icons in, in, in those messages. Anyway, that will do me, I think. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh. It's great listening to you guys talking. Now is the time for all of you to rush to the chat box and put in some some questions. And I have got um, a message. Uh, Millie, could would, uh, hopefully you'd be happy for me to read this one out. So Millie, who's um, on the in the conference, was saying that she is a young person herself, twenty three year old, been to many of the youth climate strikes and. Um, he's making two points here. One is that she feels like the questions that she gets often asked from journalists is just trying to trip you up rather than trying to support the strikes message. And I just want to say, Millie, I know that happens all the time. And I apologise on behalf of all those wretched journalists who do that. I've seen that happen so many times. And it's uh, we're not still debating whether climate change is a problem, whether we should do something about it. So that's so exasperating when that when that keeps happening in its room as well. Um, also says here, I also feel there's a narrative surrounding young people's passions for climate activism suggests that they only care about climate change because they don't have anything real to care about, e.g. putting food on the table. Did anybody want to have a comment about that? And thank you so much Lily, for posting those questions and comments. Now, 
anyone else come across commentary like that? Sam, you're nodding. Um, yeah, young people is capable. And I, I think I, I, I dropped a question in a session yesterday with Nikki and Manuel and then had to disappear. And I think Nikki's probably going to, for those of you who are wanting to explore mo more about in the next session around uh, organisation and values and how we might do, do that, some, some of that work as, I guess, as adults or as, as experts, how do we um, uh, put forward youth uh, I, I feel like it's youth wisdom, but or, or youth centred knowledges in a way that isn't isn't exploitative or tokenistic. Um, and Nikki's probably better better qualified to. I mean, I, I I loved that there was almost a flat out contradiction between what you and I said, Sam, in terms of what activism is. Um, because you know, when I was thinking about this, I was I became obsessed with what hard work activism is, and it seemed to me more and more to call every act of just moving into a political space and saying something, activism, um, didn't honour the, the, the sort of more difficult, complex activism. But then you positioned it, I think, as um, in a sense, the opposite of a job, because activism is something that comes from within. It's a resistance to the status quo. It's almost like a sort of impulse. I don't mean impulse in a it, I don't mean impulse in a way that I'm trying to um, in any way diminish it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's life itself in a sense, I think. Um, so that comes back to that idea of what young people can do. And I think um, one of the things I find, I find excruciating, I'm not the mum of an activist, I'm the mum of three children, but none of them are activists. Um, I, what I do find excruciating is when young people try to articulate um, the problem in a way that to me is clearly received knowledge. And, and this is not, is not to say that adults aren't doing that all the time as well, but young people are doing it particularly so. Um, and I find that, I find that really excruciating um, for lots of reasons. But when young people, perhaps what's appealing about um, the simple waving of banners is that that impulse, the kind of sense that it's, all going wrong and can't you adults fix it up is in a way the most authentic one um, so but also at the same time I really support young people having a voice in trying to articulate these complex issues but you know I find what they say in that field you know, for my own personal learning, I'd be, rather be listening to an expert on climate change than a 16-year-old if I wanted to learn about climate change is what I'm getting at. Um, hmm. Yeah, well, there's two things there, Nikki, that I was thinking, and, and one was just in response to Millie, what Millie was saying, because when you were talking about you saying that you really find that excruciating listening to young people talk about using talking about received knowledge often that's because that's a question that they're being asked and that comes back to merely saying it seems like sometimes the journalists are just trying to trip me up exactly often what the journalists are trying to to to, to expose is that oh you've just learned to say this but in a way maybe it's enough this is my point to just know that there's a huge climate problem out there that not enough has been doing about and if you're going to ask me what is the problem well I'm going to tell you that it's this this and this because I've prepared for my interview but <laughs> do I have to say that isn't it just obvious that it's a problem but they can't just say that because we're always expected to you know justify it that's and that's really what um Millie you're talking about isn't it yeah, I think that's it's it's right, isn't it? It's it's that sort of devaluing of 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 certain responses because you're not you're not a sufficient knower, or or you're not sufficiently qualified. Rather than saying, um, how do we value that a that a fourteen year old can get on stage and say this is shit, and we need to rethink our future around these kinds of values that I see as a as a young person. How do we you know, and, and part of that is, I guess, the role of the media and how they, they value the other things <laughs> or, or value some things over others. But, um, yeah, maybe that's a, a part of our role as, as adults and adult uh, activists, psychologists. 
I mean, it's. Uh, I can see what's coming up there from from Amanda, and I think Heather, your comment might be unfinished. Um, that sort of walking alongside, and I, I'm I'm trying to kind of imagine what that looks like. And I'm thinking of one panel that I was on. You, some of you may have heard of Chloe Schwarber because she's a um, young New Zealand politician who just won her seat in our election, green politician. Um, and she, Chloe Schwalbeck and I and this um, and a school strike for climate activist were on a panel together. And the school strike for climate activist was utterly compelling because basically all she did was talk about her feelings. And it was it was extraordinarily compelling. And Chloe Schwalbeck's young but extremely savvy and I did my gig so I'm imagining if standing alongside but that makes you so vulnerable because you know what's worrying me here is that what, what young people have is their feelings who wants to talk about their feelings in front of the world or, or in other words it's, it's too much to ask people to do that as well do you think Susie as the mother of a child with feelings who, <laughs> who's in the New York Times? Yeah, well, I think it depends on how, um, you know, that person is being listened to at the time when they are vulnerably, vulnerably talking about their feelings. Um, because Millie's point, and I've heard journalists do it to one of our littlest kids, an 11 year old, just grilled him on the phone um, uh, and about, you know what he was talking about so if they're getting rebuffed or slammed for feeling the way they slam that would be an outrageous thing to do but if it's being received sensitively which no doubt would have been in that form that you were talking about then that is a safe thing um for them to do and i also was on a panel with a young girl the other day year 12 student from tasmania and it was a um a climate and health and well-being session that was organized by a group of doctors in Tasmania and uh, she also was very powerful because she just spoke about her own personal experiences and feelings about everything and she was really it was the best young person I'd heard speak forever. Mm. But again it can become stylized can't it because you know, the emotion, even an emotional display can become stylized. This is a problem, can't it? So, so in other words, you know, we all know that we can, um, well, we've all done this at funerals. Well, maybe you haven't, but I certainly have. I've spoken with a kind of um, a put on grief, you know, with a with an awareness that a certain um, somberness and sorrow is appropriate. And so, attempted to convey that with more depth than I felt it you know and, and that's just part of the ritual of funerals but I guess in a way feelings can also become just another kind of tool that gets um, appropriated or, or whatever um, yeah I'm just going to read out Alison's comment if that's okay I think we often listen to the young people on the front lines of activist platforms those with a voice but we do need to consider the complexity of silence silence is resistance mm -hmm. as doing the inner work of finding voice and of surviving mm. and I could also add to that as well because I've just observed it in the school strike network is that the kids um, that are the quiet ones that don't have a voice and Malou would be one of them then they just they don't they'd never speak up unless they were absolutely you know put with a microphone right in front of them so they get lost in amongst the the, the chattering noisy confident extrovert ones as well so that's a it's a different thing again and i'm, I'm reminded of um of, i'm going to pinch nikki's uh, acronym of stars which is a bit more related to institutional but i think that idea of slow tiny acts of resistance might be a really nice way to sometimes think about activism beyond those those needing to be loud and boisterous but that, that perhaps are quieter uh smaller ways that, that that is that is going on in in youth activism and i see yeah heather um 
yes, trusting the science over, yes. So I think Heather's point there is that as adults, of course, we're also in a sense, just mirroring received knowledge because most of us are not climate scientists that have actually read the, read the stuff. Um, so we're kind of taking on a certain faith, all of that. I often wonder if the reason why sometimes I think some people are, wow, that person's knowledgeable versus heard it all before is because I've kind of heard it all before. And actually everybody, almost everybody is sort of repeating, um, repeating stuff or most many people are in this space. I'm aware of time, I think we're supposed to stop. Yeah. Oh yes, thank you for being yeah. the timekeeper. You're right, we are meant to stop. <laughs> thank you everybody for participating and listening and thinking that through and keep thinking about it and arguing about it and wondering about it because we a, we've got a planet to save and we've got young people to cherish and allow to flourish and to fall in love with the world and have a joyful time at the same time as, as the work that we do to restore a safe climate. Thank you all so much for coming.